Schmobile, you hear Harloff and I talk about it all the time. We like to go to a lot of events, a lot of sports, concerts, buying tickets to those things. It can get complicated, confusing. Not with SeatGeek. That's what we use. That's what you should use. SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to every type of live event. doesn't matter if you're looking for a last-minute deal, you're planning an evening out, or you just want to find the perfect gift for somebody else. SeatGeek helps you find the best seats at the best prices Fully guaranteed. You want to be there. You want to experience it. You want to soak it in. You want to smell it. You want to taste it. That's what SeatGeek lets you do. I have the app on my phone. That's how I do it. You just you, you download it. A few taps. You instantly have your seats. I actually just used SeatGeek. Christian just used it. He went to some wrestling thing that he loved. Now he's going to implement all those great ideas into the Schmodown. All thanks to SeatGeek. It's designed to make your ticket buying experience. It's easy. It's simple. It saves you time and money. by You don't have to search multiple ticket sites to compare prices. SeatGeek does that for you and now you get the most bang for your buck because seat geek grades every ticket based on value to help you immediately identify the best seats that are going to fit your particular budget so every purchase is fully guaranteed you can buy with confidence on seat geek so right now be like me make it your go-to app to find the best deals on every type of ticket from sports to concerts to comedy and theater and best of all our listener is going to get 20 dollars off their first seat geek purchase just download the seat geek app and enter the promo code schmo Today, that's singular schmo, S C H M O E. That's promo code schmo for twenty dollars off your first Seat Geek purchase. And enjoy. I'll probably see you there. Y'all dealing with the king. If you wanna come and get it, let the outlaw get you out your seats. You want sports talk politics? He don't give a shit. Everyone can say speak, follow it. About to issue y'all a master class. You wanna pass? Come slinging the new podcast, eat candy ass. Grab a toss, bitch, get information. It's your boy John Roker. Welcome to the Outlaw Nation. Welcome, everybody, to this week's edition of the Outlaw Nation podcast here on the Schmoes No Plus podcast channel. Uh, I've been off for a couple of weeks. I had bronchitis. I had stuff going on. Just been a very busy couple of weeks, so I apologize that there hasn't been a new episode. But hey, you guys know whenever I take a couple of weeks off, I come back with a with a blockbuster episode. And damn if we don't have one today. The Oscars nominations just came out, and I was like, who do I call to come on the show to talk about it? And immediately... My mind went to the pink-haired lady, one of the most amazing people that I've gotten to know as I've gotten into this industry, one of the sweetest people I've gotten to know, and one of the most knowledgeable people about films that I've gotten to know, uh, the lovely Gray Drake. Hey! <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. That was a, those are all very nice things to say. Oh, thank you. And coming from a man with weak lungs, yes, it really like means something. I'm slowly me. recovering. Oh, oh my god! It's, what I is, have the weak lungs too. Do you do? Do you I have do. the? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a uh, it's been a tough flu season. Yeah, but that's why. These nominations have come out, and it just feels like time to rejoice. <laughs> Let's leave this flu season behind, babies. Yeah. And this is important. I didn't even ask you this before we started recording. Yeah. Should I edit out my swears? No, absolutely not. Oh, thank God. Yeah. Um, because I have a lot of swearing to do. Good. <laughs> <laughs> You've got some thoughts is what you're I saying. I do. I have some thoughts. <laughs> well, I want to give people a little bit of a background here. Gray Drake, what's your official title of Rotten Tomatoes now? I'm the senior editor of Rotten Tomatoes. That's right. And so when you when did you get into this bit? Like, where, where are you from originally? Like, how did, this, how did you trip into this oh, thing? What a long, twisty, turny road it's been. <laughs> My God. Um, I began working for Rotten Tomatoes in 2012, the year okay. of our Lord. Yes. And uh, I had previously uh r written reviews for movies.com mm -hmm. uh that's where christian and mark and i first met oh they're movies.com buddies okay and so we were like young scrappy kids with like hope and optimism in our <laughs> eyes and i was coming off of a po homegrown podcast oh. that i did in my studio apartment affectionately known as the popcorn mafia I had a co-host, and we had all these amazing guests, including the great Doug Jones, by the way, wow. one of the stars of Shape of Water. Mm -hmm. uh, and Movies.com was like, ring, ring, Gray Drake, do you write reviews? And I was like, well, I'm like literate, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> 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 Which they, it's fair that they didn't know that. And um, so I started writing reviews, working with CNN, doing reviews on their weekend shows. Wow. 
Yeah, and then uh, started working for RT. All this from your all this from your uh, podcast in your studio yeah. apartment. I, Incredible. Yeah, I have. I'm actually one of those people that was plucked from internet obscurity to internet acclaim. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Like, and 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 my background is in filmmaking. I'm a former okay. cinematographer, uh, primarily an editor. Okay, and I've I've directed, uh, but like. Nothing you would have seen. <laughs> like, let's be clear about that. But uh, I, I'm really proud, actually. This is like a little-known Gray Drake fact that I, I, for my senior thesis, I directed a television length, so about 21 minutes, mm -hmm. short film, which was sort of the original high school musical entitled Stupid in Love. Wow. Which I'm still really proud of to this day. Uh, and I think that that's one of the best things about my background that helps me do what I do now, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I don't write reviews anymore. I do not contribute to the tomato meter. I'm just a messenger. Mm -hmm. And my perspective in coming from films, it's a little similar to Christian in a way, mm -hmm. you know, it's like if you've been in the, if you've been in the industry and you've kind of seen that side of it, it helps you when you're watching film and television shows because you can kind of get it, yeah. Even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't reach me, I can still appreciate it on some level, and I can also translate who would appreciate the film. Mm -hmm. You know, because they can't all be winners. They can't all be fresh on the tomato meter. No, Boy. right? Oh, God, the, the tomato meter. Oh, all God. the controversy around the tomato meter. Oh. Where, no, but where are you, where are you from originally? I born in Dallas, raised in Denver. Wow. And what a that, switch. That, thank you for being so generous when saying <laughs> wow to Denver. <laughs> no, I mean like because Dallas is so hot and Denver is so damn cold. I know. Um Incredible I and, switch. and so I grew up there uh, and then came but I've lived in Los Angeles for a long time. Yes, yes. Did I you? just never say that I'm a native. Like people are like, Where are you from? Like yeah. you just did. Yeah. And I was like, born in Dallas, raised in Denver because right. I think I'm allowed to say Los Angeles. How now? how long have you been here? If you've for, been here I like how, how long is a million years? Yeah, like, then you, I think you're years. a resident. Once you cross fifteen years, I feel like you can call yourself a resident oh, okay, or a, a native of LA. Yeah, because you know where everything is and how to get to everything <laughs> and you're not well, out of Well, I mean of... that's pretty generous too. <laughs> But you understand the vibe of the city. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I have pink hair, for God's sake. Yeah, kinda, exactly. I, I'd say I get it. And the greatest shoes ever. Like, you always wear the best <gasps> Thanks. shoes. Thanks. Like, oh, my really God. Thank slippers. you for commenting on my shoe game. I rarely get that compliment. It's true. Okay, so you are fresh so far. Thank you this, so much. In this interview, I'm rating you that. <laughs> I'm just worried about the audience score for me. That's my own. Always... <laughs> <laughs> Outlaw Nation will be the judge of that. That's right. We love you. <laughs> so, all right, so then, then uh, did you go to school here in LA as well for film? I didn't. Where'd Austin, you go, to Texas? Austin. So you yeah. went back to Texas. Yeah, University oh, of Texas at Austin. I'm a Longhorn. Right. And if you are ever like in my general vicinity, mm -hmm. and you go, the stars at night are big and bright. I'm like, deep in the heart of Texas. It's like a, it's just Pavlovian. I can't wow. not do it. Right. It feels like deeply wrong and, and you, if I don't do it. And if I'm going to guess of text, Austin seems like the right place For with me. the pink hair and the sneakers and mm -hmm. the, outla the outlandishly large and amazing personality <laughs> you have, it seems to fit there in Austin. The personality has always been the same. Okay. Uh, trust me, I found <laughs> a video of myself when I was like eight years old. Wow. And I was like, what an obnoxious little shit. <laughs> oh my God, shut up. Um, but... I looked different in school. Mm -hmm. I I didn't the the pink hair is just like a recent evolution in the scheme of things, mm -hmm. which is not something I ever set out to do. And then sometimes I'm sitting there and I go, "You are you are a pink haired individual." Like that is strange to me. When I just <laughs> put it on you know paper, it just seems weird. Right. Um. And you're, it's like you are a My Little Pony all of a sudden. <laughs> and um. You are Fluttershy. Back then, I would lose my car keys all the time, and I would wear them on a lanyard around my neck. Uh -huh. And because it was Austin, and I, it was very hot mostly. I would wear t-shirts and like shorts, like mm -hmm. like I don't even know the proper name for them, but like athletic shorts. Yeah, sure. And people consistently thought that I was the coach of a girl soccer team. <laughs> So, like, God forbid I go into, like, a, a sports go sporting goods store, because everyone would be like, excuse me, miss, where can I find water bottles? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so, 
know, I'm like, I'm happy that that was like just a period of right, my life. Right, right, right. So. It's all the perfect. Well, look where it's led you to now. Yeah, right. you're, Well, now they think I'm Katy Perry. That's right. <laughs> Very flattering. So flattering. Obviously, all done by people who have never seen Katy Perry. So Right. Have you always been like, uh, when did movies like bite you as a bug and just like got, get inside you? Well, in, in 91... When I saw Jurassic Park, oh, it was an unforgettable movie-going experience with my friends. Yeah, and every weekend we had this huge group of people. We'd all hang out, and we'd all like our parents would trade off driving us to the movie theater or roller skating. Mm-hmm. It was one or the other. Oh yeah, roller skating. Right, the jam. You kids need oh. to remember that. Imagine if there was a roller skating rink that showed a movie on the wall. <sighs> we would have never left. No. Yeah. So or skated. <laughs> and we would have been like the thinnest, most live That's children because right. we just were exercising. So uh, we would see the movies. I'd always pick mm-hmm. what oh, movie we were seeing. Nice. That was my responsibility just because like everyone else was like a child. So you were the Rotten Tomatoes for your family. You I was. Like, this I was is the basically. one we're going to go. Yeah. Mm. Except the, that is an interesting point because I have always just wanted to see what I wanted to see. Mm-hmm. And when Rotten Tomatoes started, which was 99, I was a big enthusiast right from the top. Mm -hmm. Could not care less what the tomato meter score was because I knew what I wanted to see. Right. And what I would always do when I figured out the site existed, because I was an early internet adopter, Mm -hmm. if you will. So shout out to Prodigy and anyone who's old (laughs) enough to remember what that is. Um, I would see the movie. And then I would go to the website and I would look at the tomato meter and then I would look at critics Mm. and I would see like who I thought was full of shit and who was awesome and who was at least being provocative or, and it, it taught me a lot about the, the discussion about film, which is the only thing I care about. Yeah. I don't, no one is right and no one is wrong. Right. When we're talking about movies and that's like my favorite thing because I think that in that discussion, you learn so much about the person that you're talking to, uh, and it's becoming a lost art now. Mm-hmm. You know, because the way we communicate is so different. And I realize like how my my aging is accelerating so quickly. Like I'm an old lady. Like get off my lawn. Right, right. Well, and I, I think this is what I always push back on with Rotten Tomatoes. People come after it all the time, and I go, No, this is a shortcut in thinking. If in your mind, if you don't understand how to use this tool, like it is what I've always said about Rotten Tomatoes is it gives you a, a tomato meter, but you have to be a really like I don't know, just kind of a person who doesn't want to do any kind of work or effort to <laughs> right. not to not take that score and go. Okay, what are the critics that are uh, that they're using to base the score on? Who are the critics that I enjoy and read? Let me read their reviews. It's great to have one place to go to go and read any of my favorite critics and what they think about the movie. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people the number one thing you do when starting out with film criticism is find a critic that kind of has your taste. Yeah. And then that'll guide you into movies that you might not have seen before. And then you'll understand how to analyze films yourself. And then you understand Rotten Tomatoes lets you know which film is hitting where. But I agree with you. You have to take autonomy and independence and go see what you want to see, regardless yeah. of what Rotten Tomatoes says. It's and a that's tool. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely a tool. And the I, I don't think, want to blame it unfairly too much, in thank my opinion. You. Thank yeah. you. Well, I again it's all about the discussion. Because right. I mean, everyone always brings up what about the movie I like that's rotten? And it's like, well, what about it? Yeah. Let's talk about it. Sure. Because I'm sure that I can understand your opinion after you explain it to me. Uh, which is also why, by the way, you need to read people's reviews. Yeah. But also that is becoming mm-hmm. a lost art. And the, th- the place that we move the needle the most is not with the large films that have huge advertising budgets. Right. It's actually with the small films that no one would ever know about right. that have a high score if the critics liked them and then they go oh my god i'm gonna see that movie fun story visiting david copperfield's magic museum in las vegas (laughs) with one other dude standing around in this empty lobby and then all of a sudden like a panel in the wall opens up and just david copperfield like busts out what yeah (laughs) it's crazy (laughs) this museum is private but they were touring people through for the burt wonderstone interviews oh awesome So anyway, he just like emerges from the wall like you want him to enter a room. Of course. For sure. And he's just yelling. 
which one of you works for Rotten Tomatoes? And I was sort of like, me? <laughs> like, I didn't, like, I don't know if I want to answer that. And uh, he mentioned, he's like, I love the site. I go every morning. Yeah. I saw an incredibly high tomato meter score for a movie I knew nothing about. He said, I went and saw it. It blew my mind. I loved it. The name of it was Silver Linings Playbook. Oh, wow. Right. And I was like, well, David Copperfield, thank you for all the years of entertainment you've brought me. And also, you're welcome, <laughs> officially, from all of us. Right. That's great. And that's a great point. That's So many films get highlighted that wouldn't maybe you might not have access to. But also, some so many great reviewers at smaller papers get a shot at being highlighted on Rotten Tomatoes For and sure. get their stuff to be read. And that's great, too, because just because you work at New York Times doesn't mean someone who works at the Tolucan Times, for lack of a better example, uh, isn't just as valid. I mean, Absolutely. Uh, Scott Mendelson came out of the Tolucan Times, and now he writes for Forbes. I knew him when he was writing for Tolucan Times. And so it's you just never know. But getting through the process and getting qualified to be on Rotten Tomatoes and getting your stuff read, you never know where it can lead. And it's a good thing. And there's certainly something to be said always for diversity yeah. and for getting new voices into the consciousness and that we absolutely bring traffic to these people. And the greatest thing that, that's happening right now is that we are working really hard developing our membership department. Now, it used to be the tiniest company that could. When I would tell people like, yeah, we have 10 employees, they're like, what? <laughs> right? And we're growing really fast. Yeah. And that department is working on finding new voices and finding now it's all about like who's on YouTube right. that is a voice who deserves to be heard. Uh, you know, who who comes from the Tolucan Times right. that, you know, one of the many small papers all over the country, all over the world. Yeah. You know, and that's that's another great thing because the tomato meter is going to change. People's awareness is going to change mm -hmm. just in time. Yep. Because this is happening and we need to acknowledge it. Time's up. Time's up. <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, the big reason I want to be Clark, I mean, I want to be Gray on here rather, is to talk about the Oscar nominations that came out. We're both off of our own shows. I was on The Collider Show. You were on The Rotten Tomatoes talking about these nominations early in the morning. It's very nice of you to stop by to talk oh, to me about this. So early right? on the West Coast. Oh, we get shafted, you guys. God, it's a, like anybody that says like critics don't love movies and people that work in this industry don't yeah. love movies, they're wrong. Yeah. What time did you wake up today? I woke up at 5 a.m. today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I woke up, ask me what time I woke up. What time did you wake up? Three o'clock. Wow! <laughs> Three o'clock. You got to, wow. right? Yeah, you guys. We a, love it. You got to get ready. Yeah. Um, so I want to go through these nominations with you, uh, Gray, and see what you think about these. Let's let's start at the big one. Let's start at best as, at best picture. Oh. Look, so there's there's an interesting uh, collection of pictures here. Call me by your name. Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, Get Out, Lady Bird, Phantom Thread, The Post, The Shape of Water, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. I want to get your take first overall on the on the nine nominees and also what you think is missing. So please. Well, in an, a very unpredictable, exciting year. Yeah. These choices were very predictable. Oh, okay. I don't. It's I don't not to besmirch a great film like Lady Bird. Well, mm -hmm. honestly, like all of them. Yeah. I liked all of these movies to varying degrees. Um, Super happy that Lady Bird and Get Out made it in there because right. to me, those are the two films I get the most excited about mm -hmm. out of all of those. Mm -hmm. I think that they have new, fresh voices with people that so deeply understood what they were trying to convey yeah. that, th God, did they take the wor movie world by storm, mm -hmm. and rightly so. Uh, so, Darkest Hour, surprise. Yes, because that movie has only been getting attention for Gary Oldman's performance, right. rightly so. Can you believe Bro has never won an award? It's insane. What? There's all these pockets in the Oscars history of people who've never won awards. Crazy. It's incredible. Stanley Kubrick never won a directing award, and he's considered the one of the greatest filmmakers, top five greatest filmmakers ever in the totally. history of, of film. And so it's incredible how these... Like Pacino had one for so long, or or Paul Newman had one for so long. It's <laughs> right. incredible, and it's so funny that like then like, didn't Al Pacino win for Scent of a Woman? Yeah, Scent of a Woman, and it's like it's like really, guys, but, <laughs> for this but one, what, uh, whatever. Right. Okay, who right. are indeed? Okay, I get right. it. Um, but I think giving Gary Oldman the Best Actor award would be great for this role yeah. because 
it was spectacular. Mm-hmm. This to me is like giving a career achievement Oscar uh, to him, just like it, The Revenant with Leo, which yes. I thought he was amazing in. Yeah. And so it, those are good. Surprised that it got Best Picture. Though. Yeah. Now, uh, Call Me By Your Name did not surprise me at all. Right. It's really... I didn't love this movie as much as everyone else. You? I have to agree with you. I, I Everyone told me how I made like a, a Perry Nemiroff and Rachel Cushing just could not stop glowing about this movie and my friend Michael Vogel. And I, I saw it and I was like... I don't know if maybe it's too, it was too late for me to see it or it something, but but it just didn't grab me or move me in, in uh, like a lot of other films that aren't in this category did. Yeah, interesting. Because Call Me By Your Name had a really hard time yeah. with Army Hammer's obvious age difference from Timothy Chalamet. It, yeah. I It really disconnected me from the film. Mm-hmm. While I was still aware that it was beautiful, that it was very lyrically told, it was a very unusual movie, the movie didn't nab me until the very end when Michael Stuhlbarg gives this amazing speech. Yes. And it was so beautiful and so moving and made, and I have not stopped thinking about it since I saw the film in November. Right. And so I was like... Well, wow. And what a year that dude has had. Yeah. He's in like 8,500 movies this year. He's in like Shape of Water 2. Yeah. And he was in The Post. And yep. he's in this. And every time. It's gotten to the point where I'm like, stool bark, stool bark. <laughs> Plus, he, I just like saying his name. It's a great name. And he may be one of those ones, Gray, that doesn't win an Oscar for quite some time. I know. Which is unfortunate. Because I, I remember him in, with the Coen Brothers, Serious Man. Is yeah, that what yeah. it is? I always get it confused with Simple Man. Yeah. I think it's Simple Man. I don't know, oh, but Colin, oh yeah, maybe it is, is Colin man. Firth, whatever the Colin Firth one was. Yeah, those are those two that yeah. I agree with you. But I remember in Boardwalk Empire, him playing yep. Al Capone and all, or uh, no, uh, I forget what he was, but he played whatever, the, but the he's gambler, awesome. but he was fantastic in it. But he's been in so many things. Even in Men in Black Three, he's great in the little part that he has. So he's always solid when he comes yeah. in, and he, he can play evil, he can play sweet, he can play heartbreaking. He's just incredible actor. So hopefully, at some point down the line, he gets. But I agree with you. Darkest Hour. It, it, for me, I think you remove that and you put in Molly's Game. If you want to put in a film that is carried by one actor and is still a good film outside of that actor, mm. I think Molly's Game qualifies more than Darkest Hour because the characters around uh, uh, Jessica Chastain are more fleshed out than the characters around uh, Gary Oldman in Darkest Hour. That's interesting. But I mean, who cares about British people? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the views of Great Drake are Great Drake's only and not the Outlaw Nations. <laughs> um, I would fist fight you over Molly's game because oh. I want Big Sick to be in there. Oh, that's fair. Absolutely. Well, so, I would take the post out and put Big Sick in there, in my opinion. Isn't that interesting that the post... So when I saw that movie in the theater and mm-hmm. it was one of the first screenings and the audience was... They were all press, by yeah. the way. So totally biased standing up and cheering and I was so moved and I was crying and I couldn't believe how moved I was by the film. No awards momentum at all whatsoever. I know. Hasn't won anything. Not going to win anything. Like if you get in that acting category, the fact that you got Denzel Washington in there meant that Tom Hanks, no way. Right. Meryl Streep, it's like, well, we just nominate her because if she doesn't get nominated, then she's probably going to set the town on fire. (laughs) I guess. So uh, the post is not going to win. I will agree with you that I would I would trade I, I'll I'll take that trade. What about I Tonya? Do you think it should have been one of these nominees, at least the tenth nominee, if nothing else? Man, that would have been awesome, right? Right. Because it it only gets better every time I've watched it. Mm-hmm. I don't normally watch movies. I don't have time to watch them more than once, mm-hmm. and I watch that three times. Wow. Gladly. Yeah. That's incredible. I just loved it, and it gets better every time. Yeah. And my watching of it also changed based on what's going on in the industry. Uh, and and in life, and so yeah. the the portrait of Tanya Harding that they painted, I thought was a very nuanced one, mm-hmm. and it wasn't just like oh poor Tanya that gets sucked into this horrible you know yeah. d- the, you know c- catastrophe. She's a victim of circumstance. They didn't make her that. No, yeah. and then and also you're looking at her life, and she had a very difficult upbringing, mm-hmm. but she was such a talented person, an athlete. Uh, I just thought it was so good, yeah. and then on, but then you like sprinkle it with just cuckoo, and it is so. You're like, what is going on with all these people? Yeah. And I thought it was wonderful. 
So that, that's true. That's a good. That's a good point. But mm. I'm not mad about three billboards because how could anyone not like this movie? Yeah, I understand. Like there was a lot of backlash in my Twitter feed when it won the Globe, and I thought. I understand that if you're uncomfortable with it. Right. Because I get that Sam Rockwell might not have an arc, mm-hmm. but I think that Martin McDonough is so talented yeah. that he, uh, s- similarly to I, Tonya, he paints this portrait where nobody is a saint mm-hmm. and no one is completely without redemption. And it felt more realistic to me than you know, a lot of things that you normally see that are like Hollywood eyes. Well, and that's the thing that I, I think is interesting, uh, Greg, because sometimes I do, and, I, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm could be crazy, but sometimes I do think they try to kind of finagle these nominees in these categories to highlight both the larger films and the more independent films, Get Out, Lady Bird, uh, Three Billboards. Uh, those are the more, call me by your name, smaller independent yeah. kind of smaller mm-hmm. films. But then you have larger ones like uh, The Shape of, well, no, no, The Post and Dunkirk. Dunkirk to me, I would have moved out as well. I don't have the same kind of love that everyone else seems to have for Dunkirk. I would have put all the money in the world in there. I really enjoyed that movie. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, here's where I would have here's where I would get super mad if they hadn't acknowledged Dunkirk yeah. is in the director category. Yeah, absolutely. Because I I'm not sure that I'm right about this statistic. I know for sure Christopher Nolan's never won Best Director. He's never been nominated. That's what I was yeah. thinking. I had that written down, and mm-hmm. then later I was like, "That can't be right. Yeah. I must have written that down wrong." <laughs> it's how, is true. He, how is he not nominated? Inception is such a fantastic film. How what? do you not nominate him for Inception? What? Just for Inception alone, if you're not going to do Dark Knight. So I don't think that it is his year to win. Um, yeah, I because know. I don't think that Dun. I think everybody like appreciates Dunkirk. Right. I was actually shocked at how good it was. I'm not okay. because I think Nolan is a hack or anything. Just because I don't like war movies. It's not my genre. Mm-hmm kind of avoiding seeing it i just it's like ugh. same with darkest hour i'm like okay and they are well they're both certified fresh mm-hmm. on the tomato meter and critics were when they were negative they were like kind of boring yeah these are kind of boring so that really made me less enthusiastic to see them i couldn't disagree more wow. i thought okay. they both were fascinating and mm-hmm. so interesting because i just to like really lay it out for darkest hour i was like yeah listen uh i just want to see gary oldman for a minute and like if it's not good or if i'm if we're not into it yeah. we'll just turn it off because <laughs> i had a screener of that one and I, I blinked and two hours was gone yeah i couldn't believe it and i was really impressed um it, it's an enjoyable film i don't deny that i i enjoyed my time and, and i love winston churchill as a character so I enjoyed God, the film itself. So yeah. now I'm getting into The Crown. Oh, The Crown is amazing. Oh my God. I and tore I'm... through the second season in a day and a half. I couldn't stop. Don't you want to like see Gary Oldman and John Lithgow having lunch or something? <laughs> As Churchill's? Right? And that is it just sort of like I want to see like Michael Caine and then... Um, and what's his oh god Steve Coogan that does oh, Michael do, Caine do each other like I want the, like, those Having are the Michael Hollywood Caine lunch those are the Hollywood lunches I want to see and this is a new series this is a brilliant new thank series thank you oh my god produced Amazing. by Rotten Tomatoes and Grey Drake this Incredible. is a brilliant new series oh um, my god I yeah so what I will say is that so Love Shape of Water mm-hmm. so romantic can't believe how romantic loved it thrilling Michael Shannon, terrifying. Yeah. Wish that he had been nominated beside, outside, like not Denzel. He would have been supporting actor, though. Yeah, he would have Supporting been. actor is a surprising category. I guess Christopher Plummer deserved it and everything. Right. Um, he was really good. But for Best Picture, I'm like, Phantom Thread? Yeah. So that's the one you're not the biggest fan of. Well. Okay. Not really. Okay. Like, I like clothes. <laughs> I like Daniel Day-Lewis. I love... Vicky, what's her name? Who's yeah, Cramps. Yes. Yeah, I think I was like, who is she? Right. I can't. I see her now in like smaller movies, mm-hmm. and was like, how exciting to see her again because I thought she was amazing. What actress could hold their own against DDL? Such a young actress what? with not a lot of feature film credits to her name held her own throughout the whole movie. Just amazing. Yeah. And and so but the movie itself, like even though I thought that it was like one of P. T. Anderson's like most accessible movies yeah. in a while, 
I was kind of like, okay. Yeah. Like I appreciated how the movie is comprised of all these very small moments that in turn become big moments Mm -hmm. because it's such a subtle film. And Daniel Day-Lewis, like he just would look at her at in parts of that movie and I would go, Ooh, (laughs) I mean really great stuff. But when I left, I I thought that was good. Right. You know, like, okay, I get it. It wasn't earth shattering. Not for me. Mm -hmm. And, and so I really love him as a director, but I also kind of think I I get a little prejudiced against PT Anderson's movies sometimes unfairly because not because they're not great movies. He's a, he's an amazing director. Yeah. But because I think that movie people like to th- like to talk about them because they think it makes them sound smart. Ooh, that's a that's a fair point. Shots fired. Yeah, shots fired. It's a hot take. Because <laughs> <laughs> it, I think I think that people just want to be like he's the master, Paul Thomas Anderson. Right. You know, and it's like, well, let's really look at this, and and I think he's done. A lot of interesting things, Mm -hmm. but I think sometimes I kind of go in arms crossed and I'm like, God, now I have to listen to people talk about this movie forever. I think there's a fair argument to make for Paul Thomas Anderson pre There Will Be Blood and post There Will Be Blood. Mm. I think because once he did There Will Be Blood, then he became an important filmmaker who had like every film has to be yeah. analyzed and unpacked and revered and broken down and you will really get something out of it and I think The Master is an uneven film I enjoy Joaquin I enjoy Philip Seymour but the overall scope of the film or the arc of the film I thought didn't quite stick the landing this was a yeah. it's a broken ankle landing off the off the high bar off the uh, uh, uneven bars it, I thought a little bit a and s- same thing with Phantom Thread I enjoyed it but I didn't think it stuck the landing like it was trying to the master is his is my second least favorite film of his. Yeah, with Inherent Vice being the first. I agree with you a thousand percent. Inherent Vice is a piece of crap. <laughs> and I here's a like I have like a very complicated relationship with that film because mm-hmm. I watched it and just was like, what? Yeah, huh? Through the whole and film, I had no idea. But I was a woman obsessed. Okay, I went home. I read the book. <laughs> I saw it again, and then I saw it again. You're like, what am I missing? What am I missing? Yeah. How I don't understand the movie, and it's the only time in interviews where I just sat down and said, yeah, guys, I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> I don't know what to ask you. Oh I got gosh. I got nothing. It was like the wow. most vulnerable that I've ever felt. Wow. And the, the best part was that the actors, when I'm, I mean, because like, I wasn't like rude about it. Right, right. You know, because because again, it's about the conversation. It's like, mm-hmm. well, for God's sake, you're in the movie. Tell you know, tell yeah. me where you're coming from. That's the best opportunity that I have mm-hmm. as a movie lover. I, I can't believe I get to sit across from these people. Right. And they all kind of every single one the same response. They laugh and they're like, exactly. <laughs> and I was like, oh wait, what? That worked. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> So I got the film. <laughs> right? And then just all of a sudden, like, Josh Brolin's like, Moto Panikeko. And I'm like, I get it now. It was so funny. Uh, yet, I, But I still don't get it. Yeah, And no. so I just, ah, oh, PT. And it soured me on Catherine Watterson going forward. Like, Really? Yeah, because I hated her in that movie. <laughs> Her voiceover was her voiceover was like sticking a knife in both my ears at the same time. No. Like it was terrible. All and then right. I did this, and then I was just, I'm just like, I'm gonna kill myself. Stop it. Let's like get your mind erased though, <laughs> yeah. and then we'll show you Alien Covenant again and show you how cool oh, no. she is hand handling like a huge weapon. Oh no, no, I'm saying she's moved to like I enjoyed her in Alien Covenant. I enjoyed her in in uh, um, what was the one that just came out that she was oh Fantastic Beasts. I thought she was great, oh, good yeah. in those films. Mm-hmm. So when it started out, but coming out of Inherent Vice, I was like, oh, this is Sam Watterson's daughter. In my mind, I expected more, and I got mm-hmm. less. And so mm-hmm. the fact that it she's like come through with all these other films, it makes me erase uh, Inherent Vice from my mind. Okay, good. which is good. All right, because okay, I like then. her as an mission actress. accomplished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on to. So we talked about directing already. I think this pretty much. Uh, 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 Guillermo's to lose, don't you think? Uh, or do what? you think there's an outside shot of someone else? This is such a fun year because the other winners 
from other award ceremonies mm-hmm. are not act they're not predicting much. Right. So this is generally going to be a year where they have the opportunity to get to make it an upset and to make the ceremony actually interesting for those of us that have to talk about it ad nauseum. Yeah. Um I would love to see either Jordan Peele or Greta Gerwig get this award. Wow. Would love. Really? Never speak ill of GDT because I loved Shape yeah. of Water. I loved what he did. I think he is he makes my job so fun. Mm-hmm. And I love his movies. God, listening to that guy speak, it's like, you guys out there, if you ever have the opportunity to like listen to him give a speech somewhere, yeah. like beg, borrow, or steal. He's amazing. His enthusiasm, his love of what he does, it translates directly into his movies. Mm-hmm. Hashtag Pacific Rim. Yeah. Holy shit, I love that movie. Um, uh, we, and so it's like, yeah. Paul Thomas Anderson, next time, <laughs> love you, no. And then Nolan, it's like, we've got to nominate this guy again and give him this award because he's he's absolutely earned it by this point. Mm-hmm. But thank you for making this category better than the Golden Globes. Yep. But also, you could have really had a cultural moment expressing the, the consciousness of the viewers if you nominated Patty Jenkins. Yes. This is what I argued on the show on Collider. I said... I said, if you're going to nominate a a female, in my opinion, female director, I think Patty Jenkins gets it over Greta Gerwig, in my opinion, because of the scope and the technical achievement and the the odds against her knocking this thing out of the park. And she created a superhero film that's on par with the 1978 Superman. Mm -hmm. You can argue that this is a sea change and she has built the pillar for female female superheroes like Richard Donner did for Superman in 78. Mm -hmm. She has this, she incredibly did it. And I wouldn't remove necessarily Greta Gerwig's nomination. Then if you're going to, and I would throw in uh, uh, Patty Jenkins and remove either PTA or Nolan and then you're right absolutely right let's get rid of PTA yeah sure we'll get rid of PTA you'd put in there then you'd have two women nominated a black man nominated and two white people nominated and one well not white people a white person and then a uh, a Mexican guy so you've really run the gamut of what film is and that's the thing that people need to understand in my opinion is Film is changing, and you need to get on board, and that is that it's going to be start focusing on more diverse voices, more people from different walks of different countries. This is going to be the norm going forward, and as it well has it, to be. As well it should be. Right. It's and, a global market now. And I, it is really great to say that this is the first time ever that a female cinematographer has been nominated. Oh, right. Absolutely, it, yes. For Mudbound. Uh, yes. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And I was like... Oh my God, you guys! Does that mean Deacons isn't gonna win it again? <laughs> again? <laughs> like, oh my God! Like, oh. yeah, that's and, Rachel Morrison that yes. uh, that uh, Gray is talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And so <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is terrible! <laughs> like, oh Deacons, because it hurts my heart yeah. that Blade Runner twenty forty nine was not better received. Agreed, <sighs> so much so for Best Picture, it should have been. God, what it does. It, Screw the post. What this Blade Runner 2049 does is of a larger scale, a more incredible scale than what the post does. I saw the post. It was called All the President's Men. I've seen <laughs> this already. And so what what, what angers me is that th- there wasn't more of a push for Blade Runner 2049 because the box office wasn't that strong, because people just didn't gravitate to it. But that shouldn't remove it from contention for its incredible achievement as a film. Agreed. I think that what Denis Villeneuve achieved yeah. was astounding but i still can't even articulate why yeah what i know is <laughs> i mean i'm not surprised that a sequel 30 years after an unappreciated film was also unappreciated yeah. doesn't surprise me but when i saw the film i i'm like a casual blade runner fan i'm not like the biggest like craziest me. person yeah. no i'm not I'm like insane. you and so I sat there and the credits were rolling mm-hmm. and I just sat there and I just sat and I just sat with it and sat some more and the movie was over and I was still sitting and the security guard came in and he was like, ma'am, are you okay? And I was oh, like, wow. I'm just sitting with this. And I said, but I'm fine and you don't have to call anybody. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I felt like that movie... I understand the criticisms. Yes. I get it. I I totally get them. But 
for me, the movie was like a meditation. Yes. And it was such an appropriate sequel to something that would have been so difficult for anyone else to pull off. And I just, I, I, especially how beautiful it looked. Yeah. And I really, so I'm now I'm very torn in the cinematography category, but that's. Well, also, Denis Villeneuve, I don't know what he needs to do to get considered for best director. Mm. Sakari was the best picture, in my opinion, in 2015. He was really good. He was incredible in that. Arrival is a, a phenomenal film, in my opinion. Really good. He should have been nominated for that. But in 2049, not going to be nominated. For, and I guarantee you, they're not going to nominate him for Dune. So <laughs> there is, I mean, not so fast. <laughs> I mean, I just, I don't see that film making a lot of money. So I'd be really surprised that would be in consideration. So Yeah, you know what? <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about these awards is that so much goes into the winners and so much goes into the nominations behind the scenes. Yeah. And it's it's very hard to describe what the word momentum means yeah. when you're talking about award season. And I can't, I can't really articulate it very well, but... I suspect that similarly to Nolan, they're really different directors, but similarly, I think he'll have his moment. He'll eventually get it. He'll, mm-hmm. He's going to keep making great movies. Yeah. I just want him to keep getting money. That's, yes. that's the most important thing. Absolutely. His movies are so important to be like on a huge scale most of the time. Yeah. You know, and I, oh, he's amazing. But I'm it's just, like, you know, Hitchcock didn't win. Right. You know, Good point. okay. Good point. I mean, just watching Paul Thomas Anderson get all this love, there's nothing that Villeneuve is not doing in his films that Paul Thomas Anderson is doing in his films. That's interesting. That's that's To me, they're correlative in terms of master filmmaking. It, hmm. It's correlative, in my yeah. opinion. Um, and Mark McDonough, I don't know if we can spend too much time on that, but him mm. getting snubbed, it's kind of shocking mm. coming out of the DGAs and coming out of the SAG Awards. But We'll just give him the screenplay. <laughs> well, it's fine. It'll work. All right, let's jump into actor and actress because uh, we don't have too much time left here. Ugh. So actor in a leading role, we got Shalomay, we got Daniel Day-Lewis, Daniel Kaluuya, Gary Oldman, and then Denzel Washington. What, what was your feeling when this was announced? Well, I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, all right. He was exceptional. With Denzel? With Denzel in that very uneven film, yes. Roman J. Israel Esquire was uh, done by the same dude that did Nightcrawler. Yeah. Dan Gilroy. So Nightcrawler to me is like this, it burst into my life and I was not, I was, I was changed mm-hmm. with that film in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, I was so impressed with it. I had none of those feelings for Roman J. Israel yeah. Esquire, but Denzel Washington's performances at this point, like with this movie and with Fences especially, oh yeah, he's so good that it actually takes me out of the film now. And I go, my God, he's such a good actor. Mm-hmm. Not because I feel like he's acting or it's very showy, but I mean, even just the smallest moments, it makes me think like, oh my God, you could never do this job. Right. There's no way. <laughs> he's so amazing. He becomes that person. And also, fun fact, um, he requested to always be referred to as Roman on the set of that movie. Oh, wow. And he got like very touchy. Ooh. If people ever made the mistake of being like, Denzel, Denzel, he'd be like, uh-uh. Wow. Right. And I- the DDL when, route. When, you when call I, me Lincoln. <laughs> when I finally saw it, I really got it. Yeah. Because he embodied that character. So I'm I'm happy about it because he was great. Yeah. But at the same time, the, the Denzel, just like the Merrill nomination, mm-hmm. I'm like- yeah, 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 just to nominate them. It's right, fine, right. but uh, they're not going to win. And if I wasn't so passionate about Gary Oldman winning as Churchill, then I would be like, Daniel, Kaluuya. <laughs> yeah. Like, because everything Get Out is nominated for, I want it to win, yeah. to send that message to Hollywood that sometimes when you invest your efforts into what some people could refer to as a genre movie, mm-hmm. It can become more than that, and it can mean something to people. And because I love horror movies, mm-hmm. and they obviously let a very clever man do more with that film than make it just a horror film. Yeah. And so every and it, it just my God, it came out at the exact perfect moment. So good, and it revolves around Daniel Kaluuya, mm-hmm. and he I just oh. And still in the pop culture zeitgeist, this film came out in February. <laughs> That is unheard of, almost so, unheard of in so film. It's so crazy. It's right. like, so, it's like, okay, well, Deadpool also came out in February yeah. of the year before. Well, true, good point. And it got 
a, it got like a Globe nomination, yeah. so yeah. that's cool. And mm-hmm. it's possible. It's possible for weird move. Weird in quotes. You know, weird, <laughs> yeah. unusual for award season movies to to get nominated when they're popular with people. Right. That gives me hope because yeah. most of the time the shit is so boring. It is. It is January and February are usually the dump months uh, for most stuff. So it'll be interesting to see how Black Panther does coming up here in February <gasps> oh, and if it has any kind of because people keep clamoring when is a superhero movie going to be nominated for Best Picture? At what point does this I thought Logan was the greatest oh, one so that to, for consideration that should have been it, he just happens to be a superhero. Right. It's not a superhero movie. It is a superhero movie, and it isn't at the same time. I'm so happy to see it nominated in adapted screenplay yes. because it shows, especially Fox, man. I think Fox is killing it mm-hmm. because they let James Mangold imagine a superhero movie as a continuation of all these other rah rah sis boom bah superhero films. Yeah. I love those just as much as the next person. Okay, probably a little less. <laughs> but I, I'm a fan. And this one was, I think, uh, I'm hoping that it's sort of like a vision of where we're going to go. Yeah. Or the different stories that we can tell kind mm-hmm. of set up around the superhero framework because it meant so much to me. And I, it was so emotional to watch. Yeah. I was a basket case when I saw it. I was sobbing in yeah. this theater. And I was thinking about my life. And I, I loved it. And I don't think that it's going to win. No. But... I was so happy to see it nominated. Mm -hmm. And you know what? But speaking of Fox, I would have loved to have replaced Denzel's nomination with Andy Serkis. Oh, yeah. For for War of the Planet of Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's another example of a studio allowing a filmmaker in in Matt Reeves to figure out the continuation Mm -hmm. of this story. Mm -hmm. And it's not just what you've gotten in the previous film that worked for people. It is an absolute continuation and and where this character is going that we love, who we're rooting for as he goes through his life, super parallel to the Batman trilogy that Nolan did. Absolutely. it's Because, I mean, the the formula is like, hey, it worked with audiences once, just do that again. And it's a disaster most of the time. And then you've got this trilogy of apes, which... uh, (laughs) So this is a spoiler for Apes, and if you are an asshole and you haven't seen it yet, like just like fast forward for a second. But I, but I was like, I walked out of the theater and I'm bawling. Yeah. And Matt Reeves is standing right there. Oh wow! So I was super embarrassed, and I was like, Oh my god! And he like walked up to me and he goes, Are you okay? <laughs> and I said, I go, uh, I'm just like digesting this, and I loved it, and thank you so much for not killing Maurice. I was like, please never kill Maurice. <laughs> I was like, I just don't think I can take it. <laughs> he, he goes, and he, he like, he puts his, arm, his hand on my shoulder and he goes, I get it. <laughs> and <laughs> it just, it, it, I, I would never would have imagined yeah. when I saw that first movie that this trilogy would mean so much to me. Yeah. And it really does. And I, so it's like, okay, so you nominated it for effects. Thanks. Yeah. But it's like with all the great work that like Andy Circus does mm-hmm. and Doug Jones does in right. Shape of Water, it's like nobody even knows his name and the Shape of Water's nominated for like 13 Oscars. Yeah. And you, you know? could argue what he does in a relation with Sally Hawkins is incredible. And, <sighs> and so you it, can't even see his mouth. You can't even see his like, mouth. It's incredible. This is like, this is like uh, Carl Urban, yeah. Judge Dredd. Oh, yeah. Like, I was like, how is this such a good acting performance? It's incredible. I can't even see this bro's eyes. <laughs> like, he's so, like, how did he do all that with his mouth? Well, and the other, the other thing that uh, you can bring up with this situation, in my opinion, for actor and leader role, I think a lot of people overlooking Christian Bale. It, it, it came out oh, too late. Hostels. In Hostels. He's incredible in Hostels, and no one's talking about it. Um, but... I think the big thing, real quick, James Franco. What did you? Oh boy! See, this was my contention on Collider. I thought, I, in my opinion, they went in and they because the 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 allegations came out the day before the ballots were or became public. Yeah. The day before the ballots were due. Yeah. There's no way six thousand were like, oh wait, change my change my vote. Did he really? Do you think he? Was not going to be nominated anymore, or do you think, do you believe, like I believe, that the Academy might have gone in and scrunched his name out and moved the next person? Up? That's interesting. I, I, There's no way of knowing, and I picked him early on mm-hmm. as my upset. Yeah. Where I was To be like, nominated or to win? 
uh, actually to win. Wow. Because I, I was like, well, if they want to make a big splash, yeah. like a splash that when like Sylvester Stallone didn't win oh, for Creed, right? Bullshit. Which was like infuriating. Bullshit. Um, I was like, if they want to make a splash, they're going to nom- they're going to give the award to James Franco for this role that he was born to play that yeah. he was amazing in. And I, I don't think that it's entirely unlikely that like something happened mm-hmm. with the voting body or with the Academy or whatever. Cause it's like, yeah, he's not going to like show up anywhere and right. we just can't like, we have to keep, it's good that the, it got nominated for adapted. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it's not going to win in that category. Right. So it's like, okay, but, and also like, I just want another opportunity to see Tommy. Why? So, <laughs> on the stage and I like want but I want him to speak I don't want him to get pushed away even though it wasn't his speech to give I I still like felt sad in my heart right and so I would love to see that kind of wild recognition for the heart of his story Mm -hmm. not for the room or because it's like cool as a as a hipster to say that right because they took the disaster artist and I don't believe that this existed in the book it was a great book Mm -hmm. but They took the book and they turned it into a story about dreams. Yeah. And about friendship and about like sticking together. Yeah. And I was impressed with that. No, as as a uh, a critic, but also as uh, a woman, these accusations, the Time's Up movement, all this stuff is happening. Because I I was at the SAG, I worked the SAG Awards this weekend. Uh, The Time's Up movement got involved with the SAG Awards. The producer, the female producer of the SAG Awards, said no male presenters uh, solo. And uh, there, people were saying behind the scenes that if uh, Franco had won. Uh, the women were going to, in a show of solidarity, were going to turn their back on the stage. Wow. And I'm not surprised. W- and th- and to show protest. So, I, I do, when you hear things like this, do you think this is a step forward uh, and is, a, is the right thing to do? If there was conspiracy or not, do you think this is the right uh, thing to not have him be nominated? Well, here's what I know this is a really uncomfortable time yeah. for everyone on some level and for some more than others, certainly. Mm-hmm. But I think that. The only way out is through. Yeah. And if we're ever going to get out on the other side of this, and if we're ever going to be the best people that we can all be, when we live in a world that no one ever has to say that they've been abused in any way, shape, or form, it's it's got to be pretty messy before that. That's just yeah. the way that life is. And so I I have to say that I I support what what's been going on Mm -hmm. although i do understand the viewpoint of people in the audience that say like no i want to tune in and have fun yeah i want to forget about all this but the thing is is i feel like we spent a lot of time forgetting Mm -hmm. and we've spent a lot of time not paying attention and so i i support all of this stuff Mm -hmm. even though it's uncomfortable but again the reason i support it is because it gets us all talking about it and no matter where you fall on an issue it's like take a deep breath and let's work this out because yeah. that's how we're going to get there. Yep. And I agree. And I think the approach is black and white. No one should be abused. No one should be sexually assaulted, sexually harassed on set. No one should have be uncomfortable in these situations. Absolutely. But there has to be, but then we have to explore past that point. We have to explore the gray area where all this stuff exists. And I think what you said is correct. The only way out is through. So we have to go through this and there are some bodies that are going to, there's collateral damage, there's some bodies. In any war, there you're going to have collateral damage. Right. You're going to have unfortunate victims on both sides. And and then once we come out of it, then we're better overall because this is about the longer game, not the shorter game. And uh, this is a situation, I think, where uh, Franco may have been uh, the fall guy for this. And there's, from what we're he- reading and hearing, it's not an. It's not the wrong decision. So yeah. uh, I feel like so. Uh, but let's move on to something a little more uh, vib- uh, enjoyful in the actress in leading role, real quick. Sally Hawkins, Frances McDormand, Margot Robbie, Cersei Ronan, and Meryl Streep in the post. Uh, love it, love it, love it. <laughs> love these nominees. Love them. I love Margot Robbie nominated. Yes. Um, she's yes. gonna. She has many, many moons of amazing more performances. So she. So let's like just leave her by the wayside this year. Yeah. Um, and then uh, this is between Frances McDormand. And Saoirse Ronan for sure. Ooh, you don't um, think Sally Hawkins has a shot to come in here? I don't think so, okay. but only because if we're going off of what's happened, especially yeah. at the SAG Awards, sure, sure, sure. Then she's not going to win. Uh, 
but I'm so pumped that she's nominated. There's mm-hmm. always kind of those wild card nominations yeah. where you're like, wow, cool. They actually recognize someone who deserves it. Um, P.S. See Paddington too. Yeah. By the she's way. great in that film. Oh my God. And so I think, so Frances McDormand, just like Gary Oldman has this momentum and she's won all the awards. Mm-hmm. And so it's probably going to go to her, but I would be really happy if they said, if like someone mispronounces her name, that would be great. I would love it. They'd be like, see, see, saw Jenkins. What's her name? <laughs> like <laughs> Tiffany Irish Haddish girl. did all morning. Yeah. Um, and then, and also the other upset that I would love, love, love. Mm-hmm. Oh no, wait, hold on. She's supporting. Just kidding. Okay. We'll, we'll jump on that in a second. But yeah. yeah. Uh, are there any snubs you like Michelle Williams possibly for all the money world or Jessica Chastain or even Gal Gadot as a kind of outside show? Were you Boy, she hoping great, for any huh? of this? Yeah. I mean, I feel like Meryl Streep in the post. I didn't right. think her part was that. I think it's on par with Florence Foster Jenkins. It's a nice role and she does a great job, but it's not like it's incredible part that she played and it's less active than you've ever seen her. It's surprisingly less active. Right, it's not like Iron Lady. Right, yeah. it's pitched as this idea that when you watch the promo of Meryl Streep and you see the trailers, but she doesn't, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the post, she doesn't really take an active participation in the movie until an hour and 45 minutes in into the movie. So the rest of the time she's struggling with what to do and that to me doesn't convey a Best Actress uh, nomination. I thought Molly's Game I thought what Jessica did in Molly's Game was as good as anything Gary Oldman does in Darkest Hour. She carries that movie. I get that actors are very excited to work with someone as talented as Aaron Sorkin. Sure. But also, like, how terrifying yeah. does that have to be? Because It's a high wire act. Tons of words. Has to be on point. You can't, like, just noodle around with it. You have to mm. know what you're doing. And yeah. I loved watching Jessica Chastain and Idris Elba together. Oh, great back and forth. Oh, my yeah. gosh. I just loved them. And so... Yes, I think Jessica Chastain would have been a great choice. Gal Gadot would have been so killer mm-hmm. instead of Meryl Streep. That would have been fantastic. That to that would have given me more hope. Yeah. You know, uh, I loved what she did, and I. But in a way, I, I this can make people hungry, and I hope that it makes. I don't know if that's just like me being an optimist or what, mm-hmm. but I want Hollywood to know that these movies can work and you just need to invest in them. Yeah. And unfortunately for them and for us, a nomination would have told Hollywood that. Yeah. Uh, instead, it's just our dollars that speak, which mm-hmm. is great because mm-hmm. Wonder Woman made so much money, but I, I wanted more for it. Yeah. And yeah. so I agree with you. Those would have been great choices. All right. So then moving into actress in a supporting role, you have Mary J. Oh. Blige in Mudbound, Allison Janney and I, Tanya, Laurie yeah. Metcalf and Lady Bird, Leslie Manville in Phantom Thread. Ooh. I say that loudly because I really did not see that coming. I'm very happy she's nominated. That was surprising. Yeah. And Octavia Spencer in The Shape of Water. Also so, surprising. Yes. I was like, oh, good. <laughs> okay. I'm never going to be mad at that. Um, I So Allison Janney, same deal. Been winning everything. Yes. Love it. Love it. This is the setup. I see it coming. But Laurie Metcalf <laughs> would be so great. So great. I would love to see her upset in this category. Yeah. I think that would be so huge for Lady Bird. You know, the, the so though I guess I mean both my actress and my supporting actress. I'd love to see those upsets happen. Yeah. And even more so with Laurie Metcalf because as the, I think it's like, you know, top three contender one of the top three contenders for best reviewed movie on Rotten Tomatoes it fell out of the number one spot by the way it has one rotten review wow Paddington 2 not 100% not 100 anymore Paddington 2 is Paddington 2 yes that's what I'm saying Paddington 2 100% yes so that little bear 100% we love him and Sally Sally Hawkins is amazing um and so Laurie Metcalf to me made that movie mm, more Saoirse, than Saoirse Saoirse is gr- she, like she, I love her I think right. she's amazing but I also feel like yeah yeah we got like a lot of time right whereas with Laurie Metcalf this was her role yes. and I thought she she brightened that movie so much for me and she made it so so meaningful it made mm-hmm. me call my mom afterwards wow. Isn't, so she really made it come alive. In my opinion, and I said this, it's like it, this is akin to Angelina Jolie and Jennifer Aniston. Right, what team are you on? Are you team? <laughs> are you team Laurie Metcalf or team Allison Janney? I, I said it's going to split the world in half and cause us to implode possibly if oh, we don't no. solve this thing, uh, unless there's a tie. Uh, but I, because I, I think they're both so incredibly 
powerful in the roles they're playing in those yeah. films and as moms two different mm. kinds of moms <laughs> you know uh, uh, raising these very strong willed daughters in different ways and having these incredible moments of emotional switches within scenes yeah like it's like the whole scene in the in the in the uh, in the uh, thrift store when they're getting the dress they're they're bickering like a mother and daughter do I grew up my sister and my mom bickered like that all the freaking time all the fucking time and then and then the dress would pop oh my god it's so perfect complete switch and you're just like how is this possible men don't work like this and then you and then you see the scene and I, I compare that to the scene uh, in I Tanya with the knife throwing and all that like it starts out in a certain way then it becomes so much for visceral and then when the knife gets thrown it's like whoa, uh-huh. the fucking world stops and they have to look at each other and what you think is going to happen next doesn't and it's just that's amazing work so uh, that I, I don't I, I think it's going to be uh, Allison Janney but uh, yeah. if Lori won I would not uh, begrudge that at all I agree I yeah. 100% I uh, there's in that moment with when Allison Janney <laughs> The moment when she just goes, well, my storyline went to shit. (laughs) I was like, this movie is so amazing. There aren't many scripts that can be written in that style that Mm -hmm. can break the fourth wall like that, that can be all over the place and still feel like a coherent experience. Exactly. And I think that is a testament not only to the script, but also to the direction. Mm -hmm. And so just... Just so good. Well, this is why I, I don't even know the dude that directed I Tanya. I just like I bear, I can't even. Yeah, like, it's Craig something. I think. Yeah, and, whatever. It, but he did a good job. He did a fantastic job. That bro did job. a good job. I mean, there are many films that have come. Not many, but there's a lot of films that have come out that are uh, that have break the fourth wall. And uh, it, this is the most unusual breaking of the fourth wall I've ever seen in a biopic. I mean, right. thrown into a biopic type of thing. But I, I, I would agree with you, and I think that's why I should have been nominated for Best Picture, because I guarantee you, we will be talking about I, Tanya 10 years from now, and there's three or four films on that list now for Best Picture that we will not be talking about in 10 years from right. now. Right. Man, I saw an awesome tweet where somebody was like, can you imagine being Nancy Kerrigan and seeing <laughs> your story about your horrible experience being right. nominated for Best Comedy <laughs> at the Golden Globes? <laughs> I was like, ooh, fair point. She finally responded, by the way, because she hasn't. She doesn't like to respond yeah. about this thing, and she said her only response yeah. prior to this was she goes, "No, I haven't seen it." Yes, <laughs> which I loved. But then she said, I, "I don't have to see it. I lived it. I don't want. It, it is what it is." And so is, yeah. I, I don't like that she's getting this attention. But I don't. I, I wish people would just move on. She says this all the time, but. Uh, it's a fascinating story. It's like oh, you cannot. This and OJ are the two stories coming out of the '90s that you just cannot do enough analysis or films on. I, I, know I really it was think you can't. So banana grams. <laughs> Is there anybody missing? Like, okay, we talked about Leslie. Uh, well, I mentioned Leslie Manville. Uh, what about Daphne Keene or Tiffany Haddish? Any kind oh, of oh right. Okay, so having Andy Serkis and Tiffany Haddish present the nominees mm-hmm. was both genius and emotionally devastating because it was two people that absolutely should have been nominated for their performances Mm -hmm. that were not. Um, I loved watching the nominations very early this morning because I I will watch Tiffany Haddish mispronounce people's names all day long. (laughs) Love, love her. I love, like, a lot like Timothy Chalamet, I love watching these people who are very new to the Mm -hmm. experience just having a blast. It makes me invigorated as someone covering it. I love that enthusiasm. It reminds me how special this is, yeah. how much reason I'm a movie fan, you know. Uh, and so I'm super sad that she didn't get a nomination. Yeah. Uh, I loved watching her New York Film Critics speech. Yeah. All 17 minutes of it. I was like, get it, girl. <laughs> like, go for another 17. I don't care. Right. Just do, I love that she's the freaking spokesperson for Groupon now. Yeah, I love amazing. it. I love her. I'm obsessed. I think she's incredible. I can't wait to see what she's in next. Yeah. If you haven't seen her in Keanu, she had a smaller part oh in my that. God. She's so good. She's so, and then she's like such a cool badass, like right. just unsettlingly so, <laughs> and then has this really great tender, vulnerable moment at the end. That you're like, yep. that's an actress. And P.S. That's where the whole love of Groupon started because she and Luis Guzman would take the swamp tours <laughs> and then when she went back for girl strip she took the smiths i love it but i, I love do her. i do want to give a quick shout out to daphne keen as well i think yes. watching logan again i Ugh. watched it again over the weekend because it's shown on hbo and i own it obviously but i will watch it whenever it's on uh 
She's Have you seen so it in black and white, by the way? Oh, yes, the noir. Oh. Yes, it's so great. But this is a, a, a young girl holding her own with two titans of acting in Patrick Stewart and uh, Hugh Jackman and giving as good as she gets and stealing scenes. The scene in the truck where she is punching him and saying the names over and over again, you find me 10 uh, young actresses that could do that as effectively as she did and as powerfully as she did Mm -hmm. she shows the tenderness and the softness and the vulnerability of a young girl with the ferocity and ferociousness of a wolverine and Mm -hmm. it's incredible to see the switches happen when they happen with her and it takes an 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 incredible actress with a great range emotional range to portray that and that she's not even being considered to me is insane Uh, so uh, uh, it breaks my heart to to a degree so young it's like one of the most legendary young adult performances ever oh hands down i totally agree can i just take a sharp left turn for a second and shout out i want to shout the fuck out to boss baby boss (laughs) baby what i cannot believe it got a nomination okay so (laughs) i saw that movie and i my expectations were in the basement of course everyone's was it is that book it is like a children's book. It is nine wipeable pages. Okay? <laughs> it is literally like a plastic book. Right. And they somehow expanded it with the dude that wrote Undercover Brother. I do yeah. not know why Fox let him make this movie. I have no clue. I have no idea how people got behind it. And I sat there and just within the first five minutes, I was like, what, do, what am I watching? Yeah. What am I watching? I freak out over Boss Baby. It is so strange. It is such a delightful ride. I do not have children. I am a sad old woman woman watching this by myself <laughs> just to be clear and i i remember it so acutely yeah so specifically i could do i like grabbed that director by his lapels they introduced me to him huge mistake oh. huge grabbed him and i said i have discussed boss baby more than inception wow what the actual fuck <laughs> i cannot believe this and so it i just think it's so it's 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 not that it should win over coco right coco beautiful film coco also loving vincent yes one of the most stunning visual achievements but like ha <laughs> like watching paint dry <laughs> You're welcome. That was super boring. Um, and <laughs> so, it's like seven I, years to make that film too. I, yeah, I mean, I can't. It's it's only seven years because yeah. it seems like a just a process of love, yeah. as as all animated films yeah. are. But I, so my, and so I get teased mercilessly for my response to Boss Baby. I get people asking me during the screening, "Are you drunk right now?" <laughs> no, I was sober. I am appreciating Wizzy the Wizard who is looking for his shiv, <laughs> like that is in a children's film and it is hilarious and uh last night my husband was like (laughs) i was like good night i'm gonna go to bed early and he was like so uh when we wake up tomorrow talking about boss baby right gonna be talking about boss baby all the time and i was like don't be mean (laughs) don't be mean to me don't patronize so he was making fun of you yeah and then in the end uh uh-huh got a nomination guess who got a phone call at 6 a.m this morning the second that i left the cbs studios and i was like boss baby he was like he hung up Uh, all right, one last category now. No, no, we gotta go because we're over an hour now. Actor in a supporting role: Willem Dafoe, Woody Harrelson, Richard Jenkins, Christopher Plummer, Sam Rockwell. Uh, this is interesting because you've got Woody and Sam nominated for the same movie. Traditionally, it can split, split. the vote, but yeah. I don't know if that necessarily will apply in this case. But if it does. It would not be a surprise for me for Richard Jenkins or Willem Dafoe to slide in or even Christopher Plummer as a protest vote uh, for what happened with Kevin Spacey, like people wanting to support the movements and this idea of removing sexual harassers of whatever sexual persuasion out of the of the of the uh, consideration for awards. So it would be it's just going to be interesting category. No Army Hammer. Yeah. No. Or Michael Stuhlbarg. Yeah. Or even Patrick Stewart for Logan. (sighs) Um, Well. I am excited that as a society, we seem to be ready to acknowledge that Woody Harrelson is a treasure. (laughs) Like, finally, we are going to nominate him. I don't know if he's been nominated before. I'll be honest, I didn't even bother looking it up. I don't think he has. Because he is such a... I will look it up while you talk. It's like a fan's... 
that's a fans actor. Yes. And like you, it's like remember White Man Can't Jump. Remember that movie. Remember Cheers. Fuck. Remember Cheers. It's like remember all of these things. Like he's so good in the Hunger Games, but then he turns in performances in War for the Planet of the Apes. Right. And and like this movie, Zombieland. Where, I mean, so good all the time, mm-hmm. and he can do anything. And he also made his own film. Uh, shot. I don't even remember the title. Something about London, right? Okay. The, he made it in like 24 hours, and it's on. It's streaming now, and you. Lost in London, yep. Yeah, you bet your ass I'm going to watch it because (laughs) he is a talented dude. And I'm super pumped about that nomination. Sam Rockwell has the momentum I keep saying that word, so drink every time I say it. (laughs) And uh, but I agree with you that this is a tough category because those other guys could really easily sneak in. And I love all my options. Uh, Christopher Plummer, he's one. We're good. Yeah, don't worry about it. You're right. Um, but to me, like Richard Jenkins, that's the, to me, that's the darkest of dark horses that could legitimately slide this slide in this thing and win it. People love Richard Jenkins. I, 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 I apologize for anybody that's getting irritated with my stories. I hear that comment sometime, (laughs) but who does I, um, I love your stories. I'll tell you what though. And at the broadcast film critics awards, Richard Jenkins sat at the table next to me. Now I was at the table. I was sitting with Common for God's sake, oh, and I was like, Common, man. "What's up, Common?" What's and he, I go, "Hey, man, I'm I'm Gray Drake." He goes, "Hey, weren't we crying together in a Selma interview?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, thank you for remembering that." Um, that makes me not feel like so much of a dumbass. Um, and so, I in a room like Angelina Jolie was in that right, room, right. and I turned to my husband and I was like, <gasps> "Steve," and he goes, "What?" And I go, "Richard Jenkins." <laughs> And I, uh, I'm so excited. I see Richard Jenkins in a movie. I'm just such a big fan. I think he's so incredible. Mm-hmm. Like, I want him to be my uncle so yeah. I can just, like, hang out with him. But not, like, too much. Like, just at, like, holidays. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like, I want to cook out mm-hmm. with Richard Jenkins in the summer and then see him again at Thanksgiving. Right. That's what I want. Right, right. And so I did walk up to him and I was like... Excuse me, Mr. Jenkins, I was wondering if we could please take a photo because thank you so much for years of entertainment that you've given me. Thank you. I love you so much. You're amazing. (laughs) He was like, (laughs) and he smiled and he was like, of course. He's like, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. And then I was like, hey, by the way, is Doug Jones here? Um, And he goes, I thought you said I was your favorite. (laughs) And I I go, I go, hey, man, Doug Jones, best hugs in Hollywood. I go, best hugs in Hollywood. Come on. And he goes, what is this bullshit? (laughs) I was like, oh, my God, it makes me love you more. And so I will post this photo on my Twitter, um, which is just this. This is gray at maximum happy. Yeah. I'm just overjoyed and then later running into him when I was like relatively deep into the champagne consumption. Oh boy. And was he was like, Hello, Grey Drake from Rotten Tomatoes, and I was like, Hi Mr. Jenkins <laughs> And he's like, Why are you standing over here, Grey? I mean, I was assuming he had business right. like where he was standing. He's like a nominee. And I was like, Oh, I just like went to the can and I was like, My husband's over here somewhere. And he was like, Where is he? And just at that moment, Steve is standing like not where he should be standing right. for a live broadcast. <laughs> and he turns <laughs> and then and Richard Jenkins waves at him. And Steve, like very confused, waves back. <laughs> and and he goes, That's your husband? And I go, Yeah. He goes, You think he knows who I am? And I went, Yeah, of course he knows who you are. <laughs> like he's married to me. And he goes, That's cool. <laughs> like, yes, Richard Jenkins. <laughs> I don't know what that was. It was awesome. He's like such a badass. He is. Uh, real quick with Woody, uh, he was nominated for Academy Award for People vs. Larry Flint. Oh, good. And then supporting for The Messenger. Oh, right. Which some people, you know, it's been a while, but it's been a while since he's been nominated for. Uh, so that those are those are like in the early mid two thousands. So it's been a it's been a bit since he's been nominated. Whew, so it's boy. great to see him here. Uh, and I echo your Richard Jenkins love. I mean, I've seen like, from The Visitor, like so many before. The Visitor's so good. Right, and he's great in those dumb Step Brothers. He's great in comedies. He's great in dramas. He's just a very versatile actor. Mm. And, you know, sometimes we get so caught up with the big names getting awards that you forget that there's these incredibly strong engines and all these movies. And I think Octavia Spencer's another one, too. Like, 
she, she could do something. She does crappy black comedies and incredibly awesome Oscar name in it, nominated films and everything in between. And she's always solid. So I would not be surprised to see Richard Jenkins slide in mm. and grab this thing out from under Sam, especially because mm. there's been that backlash against Sam for the character that he portrays in this film. And does he have the arc, the racism angle to him in Three, three Billboards? So there's been a little bit of a back. So we'll see how this all plays out. You know, mm. it's, that's what's interesting about the Oscars. It, all these other award ceremonies come first that expose all this shit and then the voters decide who they really want to uh, in light of all that who they want to win the awards so. and for anyone wondering what happens in the next six weeks between now and the Oscars yeah. the answer is a lot of parties yes where they trot out all of these people and they stand there looking somewhat pained <laughs> while all of us pretend that we're paying attention to the person we're engaged in a conversation right. with when we're really looking at those people exactly and then we eat some hors d'oeuvres and yes. we drink free booze and then we go home and we say like, hey, I was just in the same room as Richard Jenkins. <laughs> and he was very clearly creeped out. He was me. a boss baby. He was. Oh my God. <laughs> boss baby. Ah! Uh, all right. Well, we got to wrap this up. Uh, Gray, thank you so much for taking the time. It went a little bit over an hour, but I appreciate Sorry. you sticking around for, to talk about this stuff because we both love movies so much. And uh, like I said, uh, Gray has been one of the sweetest people I've gotten to know in this business because, you know, when you walk in and you're a newbie, you don't know how you're going to be received. You don't know how people are going to gravitate to you. And doing the Schmodown, getting to know you through the Schmodown, and Woo! then really cementing uh, our friendship during the Jumanji press junk and it's just been uh, it's been it was a joy to have you on the show to talk about all this stuff with you all day I could talk thank you I so love much. it thank and uh, yeah and I love Outlaw Nation too so <laughs> shout out um, where can people find you if they want to find oh you man, a, a dog oh just my came god cow oh and also Riley a little spot from Mark Riley here on the Outlaw Nation <laughs> hey, Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, what? Hmm. Apologies. No, no, no. <laughs> That's just how we roll here, you guys. There's Another titan here. of film, Mark Riley. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I'd give that dog an award. <laughs> yeah, I would too. It's a good dog. It's a boss dog. Um, <laughs> boss baby dog. Uh, where can people find you if they want to find you, Gray? Especially on Twitter, but um, all my social handles are just my name. So it's G R A E. No wise. My family finds them untrustworthy. Mm -hmm, well Gray Drake. And uh, is there? Can they read your stuff anywhere? Like, do you do you do you watch? Like, where can they currently, find your stuff? Currently, I don't write anything. Okay. But we're on the Rotten Tomatoes YouTube channel. We got a lot of cool new stuff going on there. Great. And uh, yeah, so all, all the all the internet places. And then occasionally, I'll just pop up on your Reels channel. Yes. Or your CBS, and they'll, you'll be like, they let a pink haired person on there, and I will say, no one is more surprised than I am, <laughs> except maybe my parents. I always spit out my food when I see you on Reels. I'm like, that's cool. Great Drake, I know her. <laughs> I always love it when you pop yes. up. Yes, Gray Drake ruining carpets <laughs> <laughs> since 2013. All, all across the world. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening to Outlaw Nation this week. Um, it's been a blast to talk about films with Gray. Uh, let her know what you think about her thoughts. Give her your opinions. Uh, tweet at her. You guys can always follow me at the Roca says on Twitter and Instagram as well. Let me know what you think. Were there snubs? Were there ones that you're really happy about? Do you hate me for hating Dunkirk? Whatever it is that you have issues with, let me know. I'm always open to listening to you all. And thanks so much uh, for patronizing the show show really appreciate it leave comments for all the other shows on that we have on the sk plus podcast channel and uh, ratings and everything like that because we it really helps all the shows like we like you know that phrase a rising tide lifts all boats so uh, uh, give all the love across the board to all the shows here on the sk plus podcast channel and we will talk to you all next week on the outlaw nation <laughs>